Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, I am um, here together with Miss Ye today. And I'm with Miss Chu today. And then we are so psyched to be here with all of you. Okay, so now I'm going to hand the time over to Miss Ye and she's going to share with you about Monsters, Magic and Mayhem. Yes, thanks Mrs. Chu for the wonderful introduction and for helping me facilitate and moderate this webinar. I'm really happy and grateful to be here. All right, so as the name suggests, um, I purposely made it alliterate on the on purpose, which, you know, alliterate means you put everything starting with the same letter all at once, so it's quite obvious here. And I, call, uh, I named it this title because I'm going to talk you through about my, fa uh, my fantasy novel and what I did to create it. All right, so this is the cover of my book. Uh, I will tell you later how you can get it. Uh, don't worry about it. All right, so now here's a little bit about me. You know, before we get down to business, I, I'm, I'm like a, a lot of you, I think. A lot of my students, they're very creative. They like to write and they like to draw. So that's what I did a lot as a kid. I used to watch a lot of Chinese dramas. Uh, some of them are called Wuxia Pian, which means that you have all these characters who know a lot of Kung Fu and they wear very beautiful, elaborate Chinese costumes and they fight. The plots are very, very long and there are a lot of episodes. So this is what I used to do. Instead of studying, I would just drop my bag and then go and watch this on television. Uh, I have also had a pretty fun career writing food reviews uh, and into interviewing local artists and photographers. I think we have a driving art scene, which is quite cool to check out. And of course, um, one of, and of course, now I teach English at Lil Batmighty. Some of you know me as Miss Ye. Some of you have been in my classes. Hi, Tia. <laughs> nice and Miss Ye, mm. in fact, I thought it would be nice to just share with them. Actually, there's the recent night festival, right? Yeah, that yeah. Went on. And actually, Miss Ye was, um, she, she actually submitted her play. And yeah. It was one of the plays that were being showcased during the night festival. So those of you who actually uh, went to the area over the weekends, um, mm -hmm. and probably I think it's along um, the, the city hall area. The, right? the city hall area, the, yes. the Singapore Art Museum area. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were there were a lot of um, events actually. Yes, and we we're so so proud and happy that you know we see her her play was actually one of the ones that was selected to be showcased. So yeah. congratulations. Thank you so much, Mrs. Yes. Chu. And now you can get back to the highlights, which is the cat. The cat. Yes. <laughs> this is my cat. Some of you I may have shown you different pictures of my cat in class. And every time I show this picture, people always <laughs> Um, get very excited about my cat because they either think she's very cute or they are terrified of cats. And some of my students have told me, yes, you should totally write a book about your cat, we'll support you. But if there's anything about me that, you know, if you don't remember a lot of things, you can remember that I have a cat. All right, so now on to what we're going to talk about today. So a lot of you are interested, right, in knowing as to what writers do to publish a book. Uh, which is what I'm going to cover. After that, we're doing some character. Uh, we'll, I'm going to show you how to create a character um, and we'll break it down into heroes and villains. And lastly, you can, we're going to learn how to create your own fantasy world. So two and three have skills that, uh, that can be translated in your composition. So yeah, do look out for that. Okay, so the objectives are as follows. Okay, if you're interested, um, you will be very keen to know what I did to publish a book. Uh, we have to create compelling characters. So compelling characters are characters that are believable in this case, and they are not uh, flat characters. Uh, characters that have only that are too perfect. For example, these are examples of flat characters. We'll get into it later. Uh, three is a bit of an extra skill to create a fantasy world, and the last one to describe the setting using the five senses. I'm pretty sure your teachers have taught you this, but I will show you by example in the book. Okay, so hang on. Hang tight. All right, so a lot of, every time I get interviewed by people, so I sometimes do events. Uh, I was a panelist at the Singapore Writers' Festival and at this year's All In Young Writers' Festival, which is in March. So a lot of the interviewers, they like to ask me, where do your ideas come from? Uh, it's a very fun question to answer because they come from everywhere, but I'm going to break down some of the sources that um, uh, have been useful for me. So for books, you read widely with a purpose. So usually what I do when I read a book is I open and I see how all the, the writer has described the character or described the scene. 
And uh, when I was young, I usually did this to transfer the skills into my compositions. Right, movies. Usually a lot of my students, they like to watch movies, but I always tell them, look for the logic gaps. This is apparent in action movies as well. Right? Um, documentaries are really great because they help you with writing research. Um, if you want to write about a snake, you can watch a documentary about a snake and learn its habits and write them into your stories. And of course, nothing beats observing um, your surroundings in daily life. Let's say mommy brings you to the wet market um, or you go to Adventure Cove one day, you know, for a, during the weekend. So observe the setting, observe what people do, right? And this will actually help you describe your world, describe the setting better. So I've talked about how I get my ideas, but let's look at how two famous writers get their ideas, okay? Uh, we have J.K. Rowling of Harry Potter fame. You guys probably have heard of Harry Potter. And we also have Rick Riordan of the Percy Jackson books, which is very, very popular among my boys. Mm. Yeah. I think girls do actually. Girls do, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do have quite a lot of girls these days. Like I see them carrying around this thick <laughs> Percy Jackson mm. books. I, I'm a fan mm. of the Percy Jackson series myself. I think it's mm. really well written. Yeah. All right, so J.K. Rowling grew up in London, the UK, and Europe in general. So she used a lot of places to draw inspiration from. So this is King's Cross Station, right? So um, King's Cross actually exists, but nine, uh, Platform 9 and 3 quarters doesn't, or rather did not exist until the movies and the books were very famous and someone decided to create a landmark mm. there. So. Um, King's Cross is the, the place where people go, you know, go around Europe in general. And so she, it's obviously a very famous station. She purposely drew inspiration to put it from the book. And in Europe, there are also a lot of castles. This is an actual castle in Scotland where they filmed the first two movies. Um, but she grew up in such a very magical and evocative landscape. So that's why actually a lot of British and European writers, they write about wizards living in castles because the landscape is so full of these castles. And some of these castles are actually quite fun. You can go there and tour as well. Uh, and this is, okay, can some of you tell me what this creature is? Do, do you guys know what this creature is? You can type it in the chat window. If you, you, can, you can guess. <laughs> is it an eagle or is it... Horse. It's half eagle, half horse. <laughs> it's got it's got a nice, beautiful beak. Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe we can just reveal it to them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they know. It's not. Uh, in the first few books, there is a hippogriff. So this is a hippogriff from Greek mythology. So it is one of the more prominent creatures. So uh, J.K. Rowling, in case you didn't know, she was a classics major in college, which meant that she read a lot of very old stories, old poems and old books. So obviously she drew inspiration from, uh, for them and she included a lot of these Greek or European magical creatures in Harry Potter. So you, so Hagrid has to care for this hippogriff and he's always, he always has these creatures that he cares for that are a little bit un unmanageable to be honest. So this is one of them. And naturally, this one is more familiar to you guys. Yeah, this one is also, yes, well done, right? This is a phoenix. Um, so it is, yes, well done. Yes, you guys know your mythology. Mm. Yes, the mythology 101. <laughs> so for the Europeans, uh, the phoenix is a symbol of growth and renewal. So again, in Greek mythology, right, the, the phoenix probably lives for like 500 years. And then when it um, passes away, it is reborn from its own ashes. Right, in, in Chinese mythology, we also have the phoenix too, so it's pretty cool. So now moving on, we're going to see how else uh, Rick Riordan draws from Greek mythology. Okay, some of you recognize this book, right? It is from the Greek myth Theseus and the Minotaur, where the main character has to go through a labyrinth. Right, so again, you can tell that he draws very, very heavily from Greek mythology. Okay, so um, actually, the story of Rick Riordan uh, coming up with the idea of Percy Jackson is really sweet because Rick Riordan's son is dyslexic. Mm, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, mm. so, um, and Rick Riordan's son loved the stories. And not a lot of people 
or rather nowadays publishers are putting out more books of characters who are a little bit different. Mm. So he wanted to tell a story of a dyslexic boy to comfort his son mm, mm. that um, his son was not the only person who was mm. uh, dyslexic. Mm. So he created a main character who was the son of Poseidon. Mm. Right, he's different, but he also has really, and he also has really cool powers. Rather, mm. but some of you guys are really oh, Chai Hui got it. Chai Hui got it. This is Poseidon. So naturally, yeah. Percy, drawing from Greek mythology and how awesome Poseidon's powers are, he decided to create Percy Jackson, who is the son of Poseidon. Mm. Um, and of course, Rick Riordan, before he be, uh, became a writer, or while he was writing Percy Jackson and telling Percy Jackson stories to his son. Um, he also lived in New York City, and New York City is famous for this museum called the Met. And in the Met, there is this wing that has all these Greek and Roman paintings. Mm. So he actually used this very famous setting to um, write about a scene in which, um, if you've seen the first the, the movie, movie, right, right? Mm. the happy the woman comes up from the painting and tries to attack Percy Jackson. It's quite mm. scary. Yeah, and. It was based here. Yeah, it was right? based it was here. here. It was based and shot here as mm. well. Uh, and of course, um, Percy Jackson needs a mentor, mm -hmm. right? And this is this is this is dun dun dun. Can you even guess? <gasps> is it oh, well done? <laughs> wow, this Alicia. Uh, yes, Alicia really knows her Greek mythology. I'm so impressed. Yeah, <laughs> this is a centaur. Um, and this the the centaur in particular. Um, who mentors Percy Jackson is Chiron. So centaurs usually live in forests, right? Mm -hmm. And the camp, Camp half mm -hmm. is located in a forest. So naturally, um, Rick Riordan linked both locations. He sort of put two locations together. He saw how similar the camp and the forest were. Mm -hmm. And it was the perfect place to have a centaur as a camp counselor to help mm -hmm. Percy Jackson uh, train and become more powerful. Wow. Yeah. So All definitely, right. I think both uh, writers, they have sought so much inspiration from what is real to them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, as they, as they grew up, the influences around them. So I think if anything, it also helps, I think, uh, our viewers to, be, to, to get this point that, you know, a good story doesn't mean you write about things that are very foreign to you. In fact, mm -hmm. the more you know about something, the more realistic it is yep. that you can bring it across in your writing. That's cool. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Thanks, Mrs. Chu. Uh, mm. So now moving on, I'm going to show you the process that I took to write a book. Mm. Okay, so this these are kind of my steps in a nutshell. Mm. Um, so number one, if you want to write a book or maybe a short story, here's what you need to do. Okay, so you need to think of an idea and stick to it. Um, some of my students, they have a lot of ideas and they jump from one idea to another. But if you, you want to really write something, you have to concentrate on finishing it. So pick one idea, your, maybe your favorite idea, the strongest idea. And it also helps to have a notebook to jot down the rest of your ideas so that they don't get lost. Mm. So plan if you're a planner or start writing like me. I'm more of a pencer. Um, there are two types of people, they're planners and pencers. But of course, if you're learning to write, I strongly recommend planning. And I strongly recommend a way of planning that works for you. Um, after you finish writing, you edit. And after that, you send it off to competitions or agents. And this is something I'll talk a little bit more about later. So don't worry about it. So um, do you need to plan? Hmm. Regardless, um, let's say you're a planner. Here is what I would recommend. So recomm um, this is pretty easy to do. Summarize your story in one sentence. What is your story really about? So for me, Dragonhearted was a small girl saving the world from a monster. But let's say I'm writing another story and I want to write a superhero story. Um, so I would just write, okay, a superhero fights villain, but they become friends in the end. All right, so this one sentence summary is actually really helpful to get the main idea of what your story is about. Okay, you can do the same on your own. Um, and next, we will also look at how, st how stories are usually shaped. So I think a lot of your school teachers have talked about um, have talked about the shape of the story and they've go gone through this diagram with you. So we do the same thing here at Little Bug Mighty. So your introduction has your five W's and one H, right? Your who, what, when, where, how, and why. You have your build up. Your story gets more and more exciting as it goes. And then you have the problem or climax, which is the most exciting part of the story. It has the most action. You know, some of 
oh, okay. <laughs> some of the, uh, some of my students are very good action writers, so they excel in this part. And we have the solutions the, and the consequences, and you also have to tie up loose ends as well. And of course, you have a satisfying ending, right? So a little bit, I think we have to we teach you what has changed at the end of the story. How is the main character different from the start of the story? Uh, in order to help you write an ending. So sometimes the story, at the end of the story, some loose ends are not tied up. And that's because the writer has signed a, a trilogy, a three book book deal with the publisher. So these loose ends are not tied up on purpose and they will be addressed in the sequels. And there is a growing trend of having sequels for the sake of seeing sequels because the writer has a very interesting premise or is really, really famous, but it is not executed well. I think this also happens in movies. Mm. <laughs> to be honest, you just have a sequel because yeah, the first one is done well. Because it's, the first is trying to write. Yes, the same yes, time. exactly. Mm. So as viewers and as readers, um, you need to look and analyze stories very critically, and mm. to see what works and what doesn't, because that will help you so much in your writing. Mm. Okay, so let's say I'm doing the story about the superhero fighting a villain, um, but they become friends in the end. So this is what what happened when I use the same diagram. Okay, hero meets villain. I can add on extra stuff in my background work, like hero has ice powers, he meets villain with fire powers. Okay, fine. They do better. Okay, this is going to be very interesting. Um, if you want, you can add in a bit more points as to how exciting the battle is. It comes during in the middle of the battle when they have accidentally injured a cat. Okay, you know, because I like cats, so I decided to put a cat in the story. <laughs> Okay, um, then after that, oh, they realize they rush the cat to the veterinarian and they realize they love cats. Oh, you like cats, I like cats. So since they have common ground, they become friends. Right, so this is how I would do, how I would plan the second story. So now that I have some kind of a plan, um, I'm going to talk to you about the writing process and how I, well, I wrote Dragonhearted. So for me, um, I treat writing like my job, uh, a second job. And it's very difficult, to be honest, like one of the questions that I like to, uh, that I usually get is, oh, how do you find time to write? Sometimes I don't have time to write because I'm working or um, I'm doing laundry. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and you know, to you guys it's the same because writing can be difficult because school comes first, CCA comes first, um, mommy and daddy tell you to take out the trash and help with the housework, you know. Life gets in the way. Um, and I must admit that some people start writing after they have an idea and they don't plan. Um, but this means that they do a lot of editing and they do a lot of extra work and they are prepared to do a lot of the extra work. And a lot of these writers, they also find that planning doesn't work for them. And that's because they have had experience. They study a lot of stories. They have planned a lot of stories and they just want to um, Right, according to how they see fit. So writers who don't plan are very, very strong writers and they're really good at creating universes. Uh, however, you have to find what works for you. And I think at the beginning stages, definitely will advise, um, I think, children particularly, as well as, I mean, even the writers, right? Mm. You know, some of you actually would think that planning will help to form really the big, the big picture to see how it goes from the beginning to the end. Then I think gradually over time, I guess, you know, the famous writers, that maybe they will actually see that with all the experiences that they've been, mm. they have, then perhaps, you know, they will, the, the planning process will shorten. Yeah. yeah, but even then, sometimes writers, they also do a little bit of background work as mm, well. For sure. Yeah, like character studies and stuff like that. Mm. All right. So uh, let's say I finish writing a story. Uh, I have to show it to people. So, so I, I understand that some writers can be very protective of their work because they're afraid that other people will steal. So please show it to people uh, who you trust. Um, I have some very nice alpha and beta readers. So alpha readers are my close friends who put in the time and effort to read the whole thing and give constructive criticism. Beta readers are readers who may not be close friends, but they are fellow writers who um, are invested in the craft and uh, I can trust them to show my work. So constructive criticism is very important. So whatever we write, especially a first draft, it's not going to be perfect and that's okay. So, but people can't say things like, oh, this is lousy 
you know? That's not helpful. Yeah, that's not helpful. <laughs> it just keeps you down. But instead, um, mm. things like you need to flesh out this character more. He's too perfect, you know? Mm. Or can you describe the palace a bit more? I can't see it. This was actually some feedback that I got from one of my beta readers mm. when I was writing the book. So uh, after I get this feedback, I usually edit and take out certain parts. So there's this famous phrase um, called kill your darlings. So when I was writing Dragon Hearted, there was this scene that I thought was fun and it fleshed out a lot of the characters, um, but it slowed the book down and it was not needed. So I took out the whole chunk. I think it's okay to do that. It hurts at first, I go, oh. But uh, now that I see the result and I honestly feel that that's a better flow. Yeah, it's right. a better flow. Mm. It's all the better for it. So don't be afraid to kill your darlings. And after I finished writing the book, I submit. So I was very lucky because I there was a contest called the Scholastic Asian Book Award and I submitted the book. Um, I submitted my book. It just so happened that the book I was writing was a children's book and it could be marketed that way. So I was very happy that um, my alpha and beta readers and also my university professors, they showed, they pointed me in the right direction. So that was really helpful. I mean, if there are no contests, you can submit to um, local publishing houses. These are some of them. They have this thing called a submittable form, which you, and which you can just put in your book as a document and attach it. Um, if you're submitting to publishers, you have to, um, read the formatting, the way they format the manuscripts and change it accordingly, then submit. So please be careful. Mm. Yeah, it really helps the publishers print your book a little bit faster in a sense. Okay, if you want to go international, this is actually really, really difficult. I have not had very much success doing it, but I did research on how to do it. So you submit a manuscript to an agent who maybe specializes in the kind of um, books that you write, like say children's books. And you also have to see whether they're taking the books or not. Then if they write back to you say, hey, I think your book, I can sell your book to a publisher, I can help you with it. They will go and look for a publisher and then they will come back to you with a book deal. All right, so let's imagine we have a book deal and now, oh, sorry, my mistake. Um, I, uh, I skipped a slide. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay, cool. So. Publishing can be really hard because what if your book is rejected? So even though I am a published writer, my stories still get rejected some of the time. That's okay. Everyone gets rejected. So I think the famous one is J.K. Rowling. She got rejected, I think, at 12 times mm -hmm. before Harry Potter was accepted. And um, the story goes that a little girl, I think the daughter of the agent she submitted to read, this, read the book and liked it very much. Mm -hmm. And said, can we have this? Can we really publish this? So because a child like her book, they, the publisher saw that it was a viable option to print it. Mm. Yeah, so it was really a little bit of luck as well. Yes. So um, don't give up, continue submitting. Sometimes it, sometimes the rejections really get you down, but I do find that some publishers or some readers who, some you know, some publishers or editors, they really write back to you and they give you good feedback. So you try submitting somewhere else, fix this or fix that. And they get a lot of submissions. They don't have the, they, it's not necessary for them to do that. They can just say, they can just write a, a polite email saying, sorry, this is not right for us. Thank you. And mm -hmm. that's it. But if they make an effort to give you feedback, that means they think your story has potential. Mm -hmm. So I try not to look at rejection that way. And besides, um, sometimes we submit the wrong type of story to the journal, like say, oh, you submit a fantasy story, but they're looking for fiction that happens in real life. Then, uh, mm, then maybe... Just a wrong fit. Yeah, it's just a wrong fit. So it's, it doesn't have... It's not to do with you. It's not a personal thing, yeah. but just keep trying. Okay. okay. So anyway, let's say you are successful. Yay! Uh, and you're going to be published professionally. Oh, that's very exciting. So actually the work has only begun because you will get an editor and the editor is going to tell you um, how to edit the book. There are still some more edits. <laughs> it's actually quite fun. Um, so let's say plot edits are the big edits. And let's say you have a character who has ice powers only and then suddenly towards the end he has fire powers. So your editor is going to say, this does not make sense. 
you need to either cut out, rewrite the whole scene where he suddenly gets fire powers or give a logical explanation as to why he suddenly gets fire powers. Okay, so after all of that is done, you get an illustrator. Um, most of the time, writers don't have a say in the kind of illustrator that they get. This is up to the publisher and how they want the book to look so that it will get the most people to buy it. Um, but for me, I was very lucky. My editors asked me if I had any guidelines for the illustrator. Particular style, yeah, the type of picture correct. that you like, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So I did request for a watercolor style. And I did collate some of the inspiration that helped me write the book in a zip file and I sent it over. So I'm very happy that the illustrator knocked it out of the park mm -hmm. with the illustrations. So yeah. And of course we have to think about book launches, social media, public events that I can appear at, um, and all that kind of stuff. So I also do school talks. So I also wait sometimes I also wake up at 6 a.m. and I go to school talks, I'm very tired, but I think, oh my God, these students, they wake up at 6 or 6.30 every day, and they're, they're all troopers, every one of them, so I should be able to do that, you know? Okay, now that we're done um, going through what I did to write a book, let's get down to creating characters. Okay, so the two types of characters that we're going to focus on today are heroes and villains, okay? So, what are heroes and villains? Does anyone have any idea the heroes are what? Maybe they have some idea. Heroes and villains. I think they are feeling a bit shy or either that they are really yeah. good to the screen, hoping that you can share. Avengers. Someone likes Avengers. Uh -huh. Someone who helps someone else? Okay. That that might fit the definition of a hero. Hero saved the world from villains. Mm. That's nicely put together also. Voldemort is a villain. villain. That's yes. a good example. He's a very famous villain. Yeah. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so heroes are usually the main character of the story and the person we root for, we support him. Okay? Um, usually he wants to achieve something at the end of the day. Okay? Villains are the people who go against the hero and they do everything they can to make sure that the hero does not succeed. Mm. Okay, and someone yeah. wrote, good guys are the bad guys. The yeah, guys. I guess the, the easiest and most straightforward explanation. All right, so I'm going to show you, okay, I've already shown you the first picture, so you guys actually have a head start. Um, can you tell me if they are heroes or villains? So you can type in the chat box. Ah, Incredibles to yes. Isabel, you know. You know. So I'm sure you know whether this lady here, Villa, oh. Villa. Uh -huh -huh. Okay. Okay, yeah, absolutely. This is Evelyn Dever from The Incredibles 2. She's a villain, even though she may not look like one. Yeah. All right, the next one. Hero or villain? Let's see whether you know this one. Hero. God. God. <laughs> God. In between us. Uh, oh God. God. Okay. God. Best review. Who is this person? <laughs> okay, this is Ruffnut Dawson from How to Train Your Dragon. She is a hero. She doesn't look like it, right? But she is she's not the main character, but she is part of uh hiccups. Uh she's one of Hiccup's friends, and she also has a twin brother who she fights with all the time. Alright, this one. Has anyone seen this show? This is a bit of an old example, actually. Can you guess if this is a hero? Yes. No. Avatar. Someone knows. Yeah, Someone knows Avatar. Someone knows Avatar. Okay, nice. Alicia <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Maria too. Avatar. Ah. Do you remember? Okay. Alicia, well done. <laughs> Delay. <Okay. laughs> Sorry, guys. The responses are quite funny. Okay. okay, this is a trick question. Prince Zuko from the from Avatar: The Last Airbender. He was a villain, um, in the first season, but in the second season, uh, he was also a villain in most part of the second season. But in the third season, he tried to redeem himself. He tried to make up for the crimes he committed, and he became a hero. Haha. <laughs> so this was a trick. Mm. Okay, last one. Hero or villain.
I they learn. Oh, frozen, yes. Frozen, yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, so our treasure thinks is a hero. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, and he's a villain. All right, this is Hans from Frozen. He tries to um, propose to Anna. Um, but he has less than honorable intentions. He only proposed to Anna because he would like to rule over Arendelle, which is the kingdom in Frozen. Mm. Uh -huh. So I guess some of you were taken in by his good looks. Yeah, he looks like a typical yeah. Disney prince, right? He does, he does. So but that's, that's like a nice twist, I guess. Yeah. Mm. So here are some ways in which you can describe your character. So you notice that regardless of whether they're he heroes or villains, it's actually difficult to tell because of how they, how they look. Um, so obviously you guys can uh, read for yourself, but I want to go through some of the words um, that I came up with when I brainstormed for characters. So chiseled jawline. So it means your jawline is very um, defined. defined, it's very obvious, and usually you see this in uh, statues. Like you go to the museum, you see the statues, like his chin is very defined. Um, a lot of people think that faces that are symmetrical, which means they look alike on both sides, is a sign that someone is beautiful. Um, luscious is a nice word for very thick hair, so that is a sign of beauty because it means you're very young, you see? Okay, so for negative attributes, um, some some people they talk about pop marks, right? The little scars on on your faces. Oh, uh, my favorite to describe old people or villains like the the witch in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the gnarled, the shriveled fingers. And usually, I use a simile like a tree, for instance. So that really gets people. Um, that really fires up fires up people's imaginations. So I think. Um, you know, it's important to realize that number one, right, villains don't have to be ugly. So this is a myth. Villains don't have to be ugly and heroes don't necessarily have to be good looking. And number two, villains actually, they care about their appearance and they can be good looking. They can be beautiful because if they want to get you to do what they want, they will be very persuasive. They'll be very charming, actually. Um, you can see this in other cartoons, um, I believe, like uh, Mother Gothel and Rapunzel, right? Mm. And I think actually Emma has a question here. She was saying that she was asking whether it's possible to use some of the descriptions for the positive uh, on the negative. And I think definitely, right? Mm. Like, I mean, if you were to look at Hans earlier on, or even uh, Evelyn, the first one from Incredibles mm. 2, I mean, definitely if you're just talking about physical attributes, you hi Megan. Okay, so <laughs> we're looking at just the physical attributes, and if you are especially planning some sort of plot twist, yes, I think that's when it is really the most applicable, mm -hmm. right? When we try to paint this idea that these are good characters with, uh, you know, what people expect from, uh, yeah, somehow the world they do, um, have this image that when people are good looking or they look kind and all that means they are kind. Yeah, so when the twist is necessary later on, yeah, yeah, I think that will be the best when you are trying to do something like that. To use the positive um, attributes on the character and then later on review that actually that person is yeah, not what you really think. Yes, and you can do it in the reverse also. You can describe all these like negative um, physical appearances for the main character as well. And at the end of the story, you can the the main character can have all these like negative physical attributes but that main characters the hero still grows as a person right and that's ultimately what we want to see so um there's also some character traits that um you guys can think about when you talk about describing your characters um i think the one some of them you know, you guys would have seen it, things like generous, generosity, being humble, your school values would have taught you that, right? Um, but there's also resilience. So resilience is a very, or rather being resilient is something that's very interesting because it is how much your characters can take hardship. Yeah, so some people, if something is a little bit difficult, 
they cry, they say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. But some characters, um, if something is a little bit difficult, they try and try again. So resilience is something that can be built up as well. So you can draw on this in your books. Um, okay, I am going to explain impulsive. Impulsive is something when it's about, it's a quality, sorry, that you give a character who just makes decisions without thinking. And these decisions are normally bad decisions. Like, oh, um, I have my pocket money and I'm going to spend it all on snacks, that kind of thing, without thinking very much. Um, oh yeah, there's a question. Yes, what is a megalomaniac? Exactly, that's what I'm going to go through. So a megalomaniac is a person who is very, very ambitious to the point where he wants to take over the whole world. So it's a very good quality to give a villain, actually. It's one yes, of always say eventual aim, right? Yeah. 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 To, take over to the rule world. the world, to take over the world. I think yeah. if you watch Phineas and Ferb, the evil villain, he says, I will take over the tri-state area. It's always the tri-state area, <laughs> just three states, not the whole America. Mm. That's humorous. All right. So at the end of the day, your main, your main characters are usually vulnerable. They can be hurt physically, you can punch them, or emotionally, you can... Um, There'll be something that actually hurts them. Right? Yes. Maybe something that may not be understood right away. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you, you know, you can have a villain who's afraid of cockroaches, then to defeat yeah. him, you just unleash an army of cockroaches. And that, yeah. and that will make for a very fun and interesting story. I would, I would read a scene about that. Yeah, so in other words, um, creating a perfect character, you're boring, perfect characters are boring. All right, so moving on, we're going to, this, we're going to describe um, the redeeming qualities of these heroes and villains. So uh, there will be times when heroes, they make foolish decisions. So like say in your, let's say in your exam, um, a lot of, you know, cheating is a very common topic that the school set. But um, a lot of people say, yeah, I'm a good student. I will never cheat in an exam. But in your stories, the hero has this moment of weakness. He says, oh, uh, I didn't study. I'm going to cheat. Right. So that makes for a more interesting story. So the villain is not evil 100% of the time. And villains have redeeming qualities. Like say, um, even though they want to take over the world, they still love their cat, Mr. Fluffy Pants or something like that. So I think in order to so you need so in order to create characters, whether they are heroes or villains, you need empathy, which is being able to put yourself in another person's shoes and to think like them. And when you can think like them, you understand where they are coming from and what motivates them. So you're able to write them better, even though you don't agree with them. So now that we've gone through how to create a character, here is how I created my two main characters in Dragon Hearted. So my first main character is Sing Long. She, these are all the, the attributes that I gave her, but I did this as background work because there is a lot of focus on girls to be pretty, but I wanted to show Sing Long for who she is. And I wanted to show the readers that what is inside that matters most. So that is why, um, so these are all background notes. You won't find any descriptions of this in the book, actually. And I, of course, I wanted her to be likable. So uh, she's just like any other girl. She's extroverted. I think some of you may have questions as to what an extrovert, extroverted person is, which means they love hanging out with their friends. They get a lot. Of, they get very excited when they hang out with their friends. Um, they like interacting with people, talking to people. They are always the ones raising ha their hands in class. Uh, I also wanted her to, you know, be interested and be good at something like she's good at wushu. And, you know, I also wanted her to be curious or inquisitive. Um, but at the same time, right, she's rebellious, right? Um, and I had all of these notes in my head, but I also wrote scenes to show that she was rebellious. So, um, this is not a major spoiler, but there is a scene, uh, there are a few scenes in the book where she does not obey the school rules. Every time the teacher says, do this, she will not follow instructions. And that is done on purpose. 
<laughs> so yeah. again, it's I think really on the technique of showing and not just telling. Yes, right? yes. Because basically, what you are doing here is sharing with the the viewers, right? The idea of you're telling them what the the traits that Sing Long herself has. But ultimately, if a book is just going to be written like Sing Long is good, oh shoot, she's extroverted, and so I don't think that will be an interesting read. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Mm. So um. I mean, in the same way, I uh, also created four eyes. Uh, what? <laughs> and I'm happy. It's so interesting because um, four eyes is still a nickname that certain children get called at school. Teasing is terrible, guys. Don't don't do that. Um, so I did give a, a short description of him. I think, um, but I wanted to describe him in my notes that you know he feels a bit, he's a little bit. He feels a bit um, dead on the inside because he studies too much. <laughs> so I use the, the description to show how he feels on the inside as well. So this is something that you can actually do and it will make your compositions better. Uh, Four Eyes is basically the model student, so that's why he has so many, so many good traits. Um, I think some of you will relate to him. Uh, he's introverted, so I purposely created him to be the exact opposite of Sing Long, so that um, there will be a good contrast. And he also helps her a lot um, because he's very knowledgeable. So someone who is introverted is someone who is the opposite of an extrovert. You don't really like talking as much, and the way that you get your energy is by spending your time um, by yourself, doing stuff by yourself. Uh, Okay, there's a, there's a word for, I guess, someone who is very good at analyzing things. He's very fastidious, you mm. know, meticulous. He's that kind of person. So he doesn't make careless mistakes in the exams. Um, but for us, he studies too much. So every time he, you know, every time Sing Long says to him, hey, I can see immortals, he goes, no, 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 there's no such thing. So uh, this is again shown in the book. Um, he's very timid. Um, He's, and because he's timid, he follows the rules and he's afraid to try new things. He's afraid of... He's afraid of... Uh, taking risks? Taking risks, yeah. And he can't imagine... Well, yeah. So I guess it goes back to the first point as well. Okay, anyway, let's not believe on this. All right, so before I move on uh, to talk about how to create your own fantasy world, we have... Mrs. Chu to help me out here and to talk Just about take a short break. I mean by now I think you know Miss Yesh has really shared with you some really cool techniques, you know, relating to uh, related to writing about characters, um, especially the idea of how you know characters do not have to be perfect. And I mean she has demonstrated very clearly with the two characters in her book, Dragon Hearted. So if it if they have picked your interest, you know, definitely I'm sure you want to find out what's coming up next after this part. So now I'm just going to take a short break from um, the part uh, on the writing techniques. In fact, we are actually just going to remind those of you who have joined us perhaps, you know, after we have started the presentation, that um, you'll see that there's a poll button. Uh, beneath the screen and we are going to need your help okay so hop on over to the poll button and then you click on it and you'll see that we're actually asking you whether you actually like to see us create a creative writing um, workshop this holiday this december and whether you would like to maybe or not you think you'll probably be traveling somewhere uh visiting uh king's cross or something <laughs> that, you know you know just go ahead and just leave us um yeah, just click on one of the buttons. Yeah, and of course, uh, other than this, you know, we're excited to share with everyone that our 2019 class schedule at uh, Live But Mighty is officially out. So uh, for those of you who like what we have been sharing and you feel that, you know, you definitely would like to find out more, uh, whether your parents or your children, you know, um, in order to know more about the class schedule, um, to find out about our regular tuition classes that we conduct, you know, you see that there's this, um, I think, turquoise button. There's this 2019 class schedule that you can click on. So you can click on it and you'll be able to uh, find out more about this 2019 class schedule. Yeah. So with that being said, I think I'm going to, you know, let Miss Sia continue with her, her next part, which is about the whole idea of a fantasy world. So we've covered the process of writing, we've talked about characters. Now let's talk about the world which, you know, these characters can exist in. 
Mm. So back to you, Missy. Okay, thanks, Mrs. Chu, for the time. Um, again, I want to e reiterate that if you're interested in our holiday program uh, about creative writing, please let us know. It'll be really, really fun, I promise, <laughs> because we will go more, a, a lot more in-depth into mm. the techniques um, that I'm presenting today as well. Mm. All right, so bearing this in mind, I'm going to talk about how I built the world. So in school, the kind of stories that you write in school have to be realistic. And your teachers like to say this a lot, but it just means things that can possibly happen in life. And that is what, what they want you to write about because they want to test you on your language skills and they want to see how you can, uh, if you can form sentences and if you can follow, follow instructions. But of course, I mean, I've encountered so many imaginative students in my career and I tell them that they don't need permission to write. They can write about anything they want and sometimes I receive comics on Teacher's Day, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, not all stories are fantasy, they are different, they are different genres. Some of you would like Star Wars, there's science fiction as well. So, um, there is that. So, for me, uh, I Right, in Dragon Heart, it is a special kind of fantasy called urban fantasy. So that means everything is kind of like the real world, except there are certain parts to it uh, that show that this world is a bit different. So um, I try and do this with the setting a lot. So there's this scene where Sing Long, the main character, is in the principal's office, and she can see that the people in the paintings move, but of course not everyone can see that. So that indicates she's kind of special. Right, uh, and of course, Xiao Lan, right, the, her dragon companion is, the, is one big indicator as well, all right? So this is what, this is the kind of inspiration I took, you know, and I will touch on all of these points later in, in the slides as well. Okay, so, uh -huh. so what I experienced in school, like the first picture, the, the one with the girl studying, okay, she's very stressed. Um, so I also experienced a lot of stress when I was um, a student. So I guess it shows in the character for eyes who is studying all the time and is stressed all the time and has to go for a lot of tuition classes. Poor thing. Um, I also um, experienced, okay, well, I saw others being bullied as well. So this was also inspiration for that bullying scene in the book, which was a bit extreme, but we can stretch our imagination a little bit. And of course, um, Sing Long's rebelliousness was also inspired by my own rebelliousness because I did not want to follow instructions or listen to teachers as well when I was a kid. So that all of, all of these childhood experiences helped me write the book in these three ways. And of course, Singapore is home to wonderful, wonderful temples. This temple is in Papayo. And what made me um, feel very happy and excited to see to see it is because you, if you look at the mural, it's, it looks almost magic, magical because it depicts so many scenes. And if I use my imagination a little bit, I can imagine that the characters uh, in the mural are moving. So I wanted to have that kind of quality in the book as well. And of course, I watched a lot of cartoons as a kid. So I watched this cartoon. Um, and also, you know, recently they remade it into this. So I, so this is a different take and a different style from the previous cartoon and it showed me how I can retell stories and change the stories to fit the book as well. And of course I watched this. So this TV series again is uh, heavily based on a lot of famous Chinese myths and legends. So these were some of the ideas that I tried to work or these were some of the stories that I tried to work into my book. I mean, among this, there's also the Nian which I tried to put into the book. Um, this was done by my uh, illustrator who knocked it out of the park, it was wonderful. And of course, uh, this folk tale that teaches the, the proverb, um, the frog in the well, I, I changed the story a little bit and I gave, I added one more char character to create some conflict and also tie it back to the world that I was creating. Okay, so this, so if you're creating a world, you need to do a bit of extra work. These are some of the points that you might have to think about when you're creating a world because this, all of these four points make up a world. And so let's think about buildings and infrastructure. So what kind of world is it? Is it a science fiction world where there are lots of like shiny skyscrapers or is it 
a place where everybody is a farmer and they live in huts, or is everybody rich, so they live in bungalows. So infrastructure is um, how everything is connected to um, one another, basically. And it's also it also refers to the kinds of transportation you have. So if you love science fiction, you can talk about hover cars, um, teleportation, stuff like that. These are my these are some of my favorite things to write about as well. Or uh, if it's not really a science fiction universe, you can talk about nature. Um, if, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, like Lord of the Rings. They filmed it really extensively in New Zealand. Uh, some of you know the Viking stories, right? So there's a lot of snow and ice, right? Um, and in Singapore, it's always very sunny. So you can use that as inspiration. Like, hey, it's a tropical, tropical setting. Okay, so what are the people like in this society? You know, are they, are they, uh, do, you know, are they curious? Are they selfish? Um, the values in society. So like I said just now, I think your school has, you know, your school tries to teach you all of these values. Um, and they hope, and that's because they hope you guys will grow up to have all these like good values and contribute positively to society. Um, but what if you live in a society where everybody values um, cunning because they're fighting a war? Or maybe there's this story where cunning is also valued because everybody is a thief. And then every night they go to one another's houses to steal things. But maybe the main character of this story is someone who is morally upright and doesn't want to steal. So that will make for a very fun world and it will be very interesting to write about a world like that as well. All right, so again, your imagination is very important. Uh, as Speaking as someone who likes to daydream in class, um, I think I've gotten better as an adult. So try not to daydream in class. What I usually do is, like if I have a thought or a creative idea, I usually write it down in my notebook and then I give some time for myself to do um, to do my creative work after I finish my homework or after I finish my work after you know that sort of thing so it helps to prioritize a little i mean your imagination is very important because it helps you solve problems in real life and when you grow up and go to work your boss will actually need creative solutions from you guys but remember to control it remember to control it and that there's a right time for everything okay all right so with that in mind right let's let's say i have answer all these questions and I came up with a well, world. So how do I uh, describe a setting? Okay, and this is what I use. You guys have learned this in science. Um, it's not important to write, like write down, oh, I see this, I hear this, I taste this. Use all the five senses. As long as you have the two or three important ones that help describe the scene, that's really, really good. Okay, so this is how I did it from my book. Okay, so you can you can see that I highlight um, I highlight the senses that I used, and I also highlighted some of the similes as, as well. So this is something that you can also, if you have no idea how to do it, you can just you know take a paragraph from your favorite book and um, annotate, annotate it and take notes this way. Uh, and this is again from the beginning of the book where I, had, I rewrote this uh, folk tale about the 12 zodiac animals. So this uses a lot of the sense of sight and it focuses on beginnings. It, it's about new life. So I, I, uh, I use the simile be like a human heart as well. And there's, you, so there are certain words that are very good sound words like crackling, which I want to point out because or sizzling, that's really good, especially if you're writing about a fire. There you go. All right. And of course, if you want to create your own similes and metaphors, you can check out our blog post in the link over here. Uh, it, it, um, uh, I think this blog post came out a few weeks ago. You can also find that on social media. All right. And lastly, uh, before we get to the Q&A uh, section, if you're interested in buying my book, um, it is on sale at Kinokuniya for eight fifty. I'm subscribed to the Kinokuniya newsletter, so I found out, I think just yesterday, that there's a twenty percent off sale on all books from oh, yeah. tomorrow <laughs> to second September. Mm, great, that's really awesome. 
You can also buy it online here. I shortened the URL for you guys too. Yes, and uh, you can see that uh, Leonard, he has already, you know, pasted the URL for all of you who might be interested to find out more. Mm. All right, thanks Leonard for the support. It's so lovely to um, have everyone here, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. supporting us. Yes. Well, supporting. Yes, and of course, we would like to <laughs> support uh, BCL Brown DJ as well as of course, I mean, the idea of local writers, yes. right? And for all of you who are aspiring to become a writer yourself, I mean, yeah, the community is definitely here to support. Oh, anything. yeah, there are, lots of, uh, yeah. there are lots of local writers who are so mm -hmm. nice, actually. If you ever meet them at events, don't be shy. Ask, yeah. ask them questions. Do ask them. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And yes, time flies for sure. And Thank you, Miss Yeh. That was uh, really, I hope that is a webinar that, you know, um, all of you have benefited from that you have really found the information helpful. Yes, yeah. and I had so much fun doing this as well. Thank you all mm -hmm. for coming. Thanks, Mrs. Chu, for moderating. My pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Yes. All right. So we are going to end off the webinar session now. And um, thank you once again. Have a good evening. And to our next uh, webinar session yep. and in the meantime of course like we mentioned if you are keen to check out um our 2019 class schedule do click on the green button and at the same time as well do let us know your thoughts about us conducting a creative writing workshop in the month of december so good night everyone thank you for and coming yes we and will see you who are preparing for psle oh yes. yes all the best all the best we're all rooting for you yes okay goodbye bye